All right, we're here for the second session of this oral history with Regis McKenna. Thank you very much, Regis, for coming again. You're welcome, John. We've been working very diligently on this, uh, so I, I think it'll go well. We're gonna, this session will cover that period from 1967 roughly to 1970 in the start of your firm. And so it's pre Right. Uh, Regis McKenna Enterprises, right. Regis McKenna Incorporated. Um, but first, before we get started on that, let's just go back to session one and recap anything that you reflected on since we talked about that uh, perhaps we didn't get to or that you wanted to elaborate on. Well, I think one thing, uh, just to reiterate or to emphasize, <clears throat> is sort of the... Um, the, the, the network that existed here in Silicon Valley <laughs> in the period we're talking about in the uh, early and mid and late 60s, um, it, it, it was 80% semiconductors. That was where all the new companies were starting. That's where all the new products, <clears throat> new technology was being formed. Um, and, uh, and it's who all the people knew each other. They all came basically from Fairchild or had some reference to Fairchild in some way. Um, they all go back to sort of the first, um, you know, founders of, or with, with Shockley and it created the transistor. So there, there were foundations put from a common kind of base. And then it was the who you know and the network. And so uh, that's how the stories of the wagon wheel where they used to go after Fairchild and have drinks or something to eat. And there, was, there were several of those kind of restaurants around this area <clears throat> that people would go to. A lot of them had uh, uh, paper uh, sort of pla place placemats. And so people would draw their ideas and thoughts and diagrams and so forth on those, on those uh, placemats. And, um, and some people saved them. I, I think I used to save a few, but I don't think I have any I, I may have given them all to my collection. Um, and uh, it, 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 it wasn't sort of, um, it, it was a very contained, everybody knew each other sort of group. Companies that were here before that, like Hewlett Packard or Varian, um, there was even a tube company up the peninsula called Itel McCullough. There was uh, <clears throat> uh, Frieden, uh, calculators across the bay um, and there were companies of that nature or even uh, uh, Lockheed and uh, Food Machinery Corporation they weren't much in the in the vision of these companies because most of the semiconductors were going to um, pretty much known people who were uh, moving to more solid state from vacuum tubes and and a lot of the interesting thing was that the early literature was about replacing vacuum tubes. Uh, and I'll, we'll, we get later, we'll talk about Intel and its creation of memory and memory modules. Those memories, uh, semiconductor memories, uh, uh, were really based upon the core, uh, the architecture of the core uh, devices. And so the early things were comparing it with core memory. And, and as the price of the semiconductors, as the volume went up, the price went down and the core memories could just reach a, uh, uh, you know, a point at which they couldn't reduce costs anymore and went out of business. So it was always this competition with older, ancient ways of doing things, literally ancient ways and the, you know, that people thought of them, and, um, and displacing them because of cost and, uh, and, and performance uh, functions and features, so forth. But the valley was really not, uh, it's hard to imagine the way it was then because it's so diverse today mm -hmm. uh, in people, in companies, in technologies, in types of technologies. I mean, you know, people consider, you know, companies like Uber part of Silicon Valley. I mean, at least from the media standpoint, they do. Um, and while they're users of the technology, they, they, those kind of companies were sort of outside the purview of where the, the real action was taking place. Um, Hewlett Packard was making instruments and of course their work components sold to them, but they were looked at as a, as a customer rather than as a participant uh, 
in the um, technology evolution of the valley. And when you think of entrepreneurial thinking and action today, the way we think of it, that phrase has a, a whole connotation in 2018. When you think about it 50 years ago, 1967, 68, how would you compare the two? Well, I, then I think that the model was still the, uh, the traitorous eight, you know, um, because most of the people worked for some member of that group uh, in some way or fashion, but they certainly had uh, the contacts through Fairchild. Um, and that was that <clears throat> they, they, had a, they found a situation in which they were working in which their voices weren't being heard. Bill Shockley was not really taking, he didn't want input, he wanted to tell you what he, you were supposed to do. And that's what I think the original A thought they were going to try and, and uh, uh, get out of. They didn't like that sort of thinking because their voices weren't heard. And, and as a result, they sort of said, we're going to go somewhere where we can create our own environment. And, and as you know the story, eight of them left and, um, and found um, you know, uh, financial resources uh, led by Art Rock. And he, provide, he didn't provide the first capital, but he's the one that I think helped encourage them to, to, to form. And, uh, and I, I and I don't know the connection between Fairchild, but Fairchild ended up being, uh, Cameron Hist was an East Coast company and ended up being the financier behind them. Um, and they formed an egalitarian environment. Stock options were given to everybody. Um, it was one of these areas where, you know, how you dressed or who you, who you were, um, who your parents were or what school you went to didn't matter, it's what you can contribute. And they were a very diverse group. I mean, they had various backgrounds from physics to Gordon Moore was a chemist. Uh, so they had a variety of, so their, their, their expertise is all in different areas, but it was great for the beginning of a, of a new form of, uh, of uh, productivity creation, which was the assemblage of things that were made from basic materials. And those basic materials required the addition of different kinds of of um, uh, additives, if you will, to, to make them work. And, and so that group just was a unique kind of group, and I think it was that formation that's been recapitulated ever since. Mm -hmm. It's usually people splitting out from larger companies, um, uh, people who then start and try to create some kind of their own culture. Uh, it, it's, it's, they don't just, just imitate it, but they try to create some sort of a, a new culture around it. And, and uh, you know, um, and I was just talking to a young fellow the other day and he was talking about a new um, uh, sort of AI company that he's joined and, um, and, and what they're doing there and how, how they're allowed to be more as an individual where they let them be more creative with their designs and development. There isn't somebody always just looking over them saying, this is what you should do. They encourage creativity in, in, the, in their, uh, work, in their uh, designers and developers of algorithms. They, um, they, you're, you're pretty much left on your own from, in terms of if you have to take a day off, that's fine. You just seem to find someone to f cover for you or you fill in somewhere else or you work on Saturday or, but it's much more individual responsibility for the whole, rather than uh, sort of the rules and regulations and strict discipline. And that really is a, is a, even a 19th century sort of mode of thinking where um, the, the business was broken up into boxes and you pass everything off from one box to the other. And, um, and you know when quality control was at the end and made sure it could back everything up and so there was certain it it, it, it led to this bureaucracy uh, of, of our corporate structures that gets so filled up and and everything has to move through so many channels and up layers that it bogs down so the little companies try to form structures that they can work through all that 
and they're creating social organizations inside that encourage uh, entrepreneurship even within the company and, and encourage creativity within the company. And so creativity isn't, you know, in the marketing department, creativity is in everybody's it's job. It's in everybody's job. Right. Was there a sense of restlessness too? Was there a sense of impatience and a feeling that something big was really happening and if you, if you didn't get out there and really try to test your own ideas, you were gonna miss out? Um, well, companies were spinning out pretty fast from Fairchild. <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know exactly what the real number is, but it's in the hundreds, I think. Um, and, um, it, you know, there was always some new company being formed. And uh, people were very curious over, well, you know, this so-and-so is starting at this company, I wonder what he's going to do, or, or they even knew what they were going to do because of the type of uh, work they were doing at Fairchild. So Fairchild was a very prolific company in terms of, of uh, development. And, um, and, and, but you know, the, the, the real problem was, uh, from what I understand, because I didn't work there, was um, they, they committed to so many different projects that they were never able to really get any sort of one product or product line into mass production. And, and um, uh, you know, as it grew and as the, 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 the company grew and as they expanded that idea. There was a time when I was at National that Fairchild announced that they were going to announce a new product every week for the next year. Um, well, that, that just, I mean, people laughed at it because they knew you can't do that. It just wasn't practical. It, it, you know, the cycles of, of testing and redesigning and so forth were such that they were much longer then because you didn't have the automated tools that you have today. And so um, that kind of thing meant how do we organize and how do, you, how do you select the right products? And even when you have the right products, how do you find mass markets for it? Uh, and a lot of experimentation, as we talked before, goes on, a lot of experimentation. And, um, and the markets they were reaching were very, very small markets. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps machine tools. Uh, there was uh, uh, consumer goods like television sets, particularly for, and, and radios for linear type devices. Uh, but uh, it was still relatively small. Let's talk about national now. We left off in the last session you had met Charlie Spork, you met Don Valentine, you'd gotten the job, and now you're at National. What was the environment for you and, and what were your, how, how were your early responsibilities defined, or, or maybe you defined them yourself? Uh, no, yeah, they were, they, were, they were certainly looking for something. Uh, Don was, it was Don Valentine who, who I worked directly for. Though there was some element of the company going out and trying to do secondaries and other types of fundraising that they needed to do through Wall Street, and, and with that, I, I worked with Charlie. Um, and um, it, you know, it it, it was um, it was it was like starting uh, when you move into a house with no furniture and no carpets and no electricity. Literally. Literally. There was nothing in that building in Santa Clara when I went in to see it. There was nothing. Um, and um, You said Spork and Valentine were pitching pennies. And up you could hear them echo. A bare I mean, wall. Yeah. Uh, even, even the, and of course they had acquired this um, failed company back on the East Coast, which was national, that had gone out of business and there was a padlock on the door. And uh, whenever they, they were able to uh, get Peter Sprague to finance to open that get it to open again and, and acquire it. Um, they, um, you know, they moved all the transistors from there out to the West Coast and literally Spork and his sons and, and me and others, not Don Valentine, uh, built the, the enclosed caged area for security purposes so that the transistors could be safe behind these, uh, these chicken wire. Chicken wire. Oh, fences and, and locks um, and um, that was really the beginning but even there was uh, 
uh, burn-in equipment. I can remember, you know, uh, when that first arrived. Um, I actually, there was the, the purchasing, the head of purchasing, uh, was a fellow that I knew that was a GME, and I introduced them to him, and they hired him, and he's the one that started building and acquiring the, the equipment for production and assembly. The assembly was done, eventually done, right in the back room there. So you could go out and walk up and down the line and watch usually women uh, assembling the, the devices. Um, um, you know, Bob Weidler and, um, and, and Dave Talbot, who were, uh, uh, who had left Fairchild and to become uh, sort of vice president and president of, of Molectro, um, which was not something that they were attuned to as individuals or by education. Um, uh, that company uh, was essentially acquired and absorbed into National very uh, in the early stages, and so Weidler and Talbot became National employees. And um, is that today they would call that aqua hire? Is that what it's? Uh, you you acquire a company, but mainly to get the two guys that you really. <laughs> that was want. really it. Those were the two. They had come out of Fairchild, and uh, you know probably more than 50 percent, maybe as high as 80 percent of, of of Fairchild's revenues uh, came from linear devices at the time that were designed by Weidler and, and manufactured by Talbot. So Weidler had quite a reputation by the time he He had an enormous time. reputation. He was the Steve Jobs, the Bill Gates, the, the Zuckerberg of that era. Um, when we hold conferences, hundreds, if and we, in Paris one we did, there was over a thousand engineers attended. Um, he was well known worldwide. He wrote a lot of papers. But um, and he was uh, he he was he was a very strange character. Uh, How well did you get to know him? I got to know Bob really well. Um, for some reason or other, uh, we got along and um, uh, traveled together a lot of places. And uh, he he uh, he he liked astronomy. He had a he had a, a, a complete uh, set of Nikon cameras for doing. A celestial photography, and um, he often left his all his camera equipment with, with with me to keep when he went to Mexico on his on his various jaunts, and um, and uh, he 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 could leave just suddenly and disappear for weeks, and no one know where he was, and he would he'd go and get on a plane and go somewhere. Um, he 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 would go to. Um, I think it was Montana for radio, ro rodeo days, and uh, they'd find him there. Uh, he, he was uh, he was a heavy drinker, um, even when he gave talks. Uh, I used to say that my job was to keep his gin glass full. <laughs> but um, um, but he 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 lived up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, you know, somewhere in the woods, and. Uh, so he was, he was, he was a real oddball. Uh, and, um, you know, he had uh, sort of, he had a big, full, bushy beard, but he also had sort of piercing eyes, you know, and, and could look right through you. I mean, he was, but again, uh, everybody knew that he was a genius and they allowed him to do whatever he wanted to do. What was it that National wanted to do immediately? What, what was the, market niche it first wanted to pursue? I, th I think what they wanted to do, and, and again, I'm maybe putting some thoughts into hit in their heads, but certainly from Charlie Spork, who was the chief instigator, um, what he wanted to do was to run his own business and not have to deal with um, a lot of the Fairchild's parent company influences, a lot of the, uh, he wanted to structure it uh, a lot of the people at Fairchild at that time were off of the, the heads of the various departments were out of the Shockley team and they, I was quitting them with much more like scientists than engineers. You know, they were, um, they always were just a cut above and much more cerebral in their approach and Spork came out of GE's manufacturing school and was much more of a, you know, down and get your hands dirty 
type of let's make things and make them well and uh, and high quality and let's you know market the hell out of them so um, and in those days there really wasn't marketing they may have called it but the marketing was sales let's talk about that what marketing today would mean something completely different from right. the way you experienced it how right. how was that um, marketing was largely uh, you know taking the product from the end of the manufacturing chain and um, and putting it through a, a, a network of distributors and sales reps and sometimes direct force but generally the direct people were uh, offices that you keep in various regions of the world where there was a large market for your devices or a relatively large market and in that office might be um, you know a regional manager who would look over the dist distributors and and sell and uh, sales reps that they had brought on um, they might have an application engineer or two and they would help uh, customer they they did nothing with the sales process they simply worked with customers key customers to get products designed in um, there was certainly you know the financial management of that region because at the end of a quarter all the regions would submit both their forecasts and their uh, past you know uh, best estimates and um, that was rolled up into a national an international forecast so it was a, it was part of the active network of of getting the product to the customer. And you mentioned to me before there were a very limited number of ways you could actually let customers know what you were doing, right? Your channels well, of communication were. Yeah, I narrow. think I mean they were very very uh, very very few. Um, you know there, there there certainly was no internet. Um, you know uh, there was teletype. Uh, yeah, but um, the only way that uh, and, and what engineers relied on was the trade magazines and um, and trade shows there were trade shows but again the trade shows um, you know weren't consistent enough they were you know if you had a, a, a uh, the solid state circuits conference for example you know it would be an annual meeting or or maybe a couple of regional meetings and so forth so they weren't something that would sustain a presence for your product or your company in the marketplace. So what did that was these trade magazines and there were there were maybe you know more than 20 uh, that covered the electronics industry. Everything from uh, you know there was uh, uh, systems design, there was um, electronic news, there was electronic design, there was um, new newspapers that were all new products, just new products. And um, so those were the kinds of things that you had to have a, have a presence in or you didn't exist. And, um, and that was my primary focus was to keep that presence out there in the marketplace. You understood fairly early on though, didn't you, that more was required. You had to be a lot more creative and show a lot more hustle and initiative than the average marketing department uh, could show if you were going to really get the product out there. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of that, from my standpoint, it came from Don Valentine because Don, um, though I think he'd, he'd like the term, I don't know that he would uh, admit to it, but he, w he was very creative. In the, in the sense, not from a, an, an artistic standpoint or design standpoint or that sort of thing, um, uh, but from the standpoint of how do I get my product to market better? And he always believed in, in working closer to the customer. Um, that he was, it was his idea to um, hire uh, systems engineers and people out of the companies um, who, would, um, who would become application engineers put them in the field offices. They weren't back at, here in Santa Clara. They were in Los Angeles, they were in Boston, they were in the Philadelphia, they were in the places where there were um, uh, in large customers or potentially large customers. And, and you know, the rules were you don't, you ever, you don't carry price sheets, you don't ever, uh, you, you don't give any price and delivery, um, you don't do anything that has to do with the salesman's job, you simply help apply, help teach the, um, 
the customer how to design these products into your store. And once designed in, you know, you, you spend so much effort designing a product in, and, and the cost is more than any individual maybe device, uh, far more. And that that um, once you design it in, you don't readily uh, change that out, unless it's pin for pin, lead compatible, and unless it does pretty much the same function, but there's a performance upgrade. So, so um, customer acquisition was really key because right. once you had them, you had them. Right. And uh, and you know they 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 called it even up into the Intel days, you know, getting a design win. So design wins were everything, and and um, but the engineers made those decisions pretty much on their own because they were building a circuit card that would pro be a prototype for you know a customer, whatever they were designing, a machine tool or some kind of an instrument or um, a variety of, of kinds of things, and so those circuit cards. Um, were configured in a certain way to uh, house these components, and um, and that was the job of the engineer at the user, was to put together these prototypes, design it, and put all the specifications in, and they usually had some technicians helping them, um, so it, it was it was expensive and and and, and yet a really important and vital uh, role to play. So get, you know, a lot of the application engineers would get very close to that team at the, at the customers and, and in some cases be considered as part of the team. Um, and um, when we did, uh, we did a lot of education. Don was also uh, instrumental in not only putting on a, a lot of training sessions for salesmen. Um, I think I told you one of the things he would do with a salesman is is have a course taught on how to read an annual report because he said we don't want customers who can't pay bills and so we want to make sure and plus all the other things you can learn from an annual report about any directions they were taking and so forth and so on so um, uh, that was that was a course that they held we held pretty regularly with the national sales force an international sales force how big was the sales force uh, at the time um, it was it was pretty small at the time um, because uh, of Don's, another initiative that Don put forth um, was to go to the, um, the, rep, the, the reps of, of competitive companies, say Fairchild Representative in uh, LA or Boston, and, um, or even salesmen, and say, how would you like to run your own business? And, um, and, and they would give them the national line to represent. Uh, and um, essentially it, it's, it launched them into a business. So they weren't coming in house to be no. on staff, salaried salespeople. No, they were there, there were these regional managers <coughs> and depending upon the size of the market, <clears throat> there were, uh, uh, you know, there could be a number of salesmen in that office covering all of the, the area. So if the area was, <clears throat> Uh, let's say Los Angeles, which was a big area, or uh, Chicago, which was also a really big area for all of the, the, the machine tool companies and all of the manufacturing companies in that area. You, you could have several salesmen in one office, but you put those on very uh, uh, sort of incrementally as your business grew. You, you didn't just go out. You could use reps to do that because reps were largely paid on commission. What sort of inno other innovations did you and, and Don Valentine have to come up with to teach your customer base? You, you mentioned everybody, everybody was learning, and that meant some people had to be teaching, and marketing was teaching. Talk a little about that. Well, the, the, the product marketing was, uh, I think, product marketing is what has built Silicon Valley. Uh, I know we say the entrepreneurs have and everything else, but the product marketers um, have one foot in the market, in the cust you know, in the customer's door, and one co one foot in the technology. And when you talk about product marketing, you're talking in very broad terms. There, are people today might tend to take marketing and put it into little 
boxes, right, right, but that's right. not what you're talking no, about. No, no, no. The product mark marketer was sort of the key. He was he was essentially the brand manager out of Procter and Gamble. He become he he he, he was really responsible for if someone had f field effect transistors. He was responsible for everything, working with the engineers on, the, you know, and when the new designs. Although the engineers were pretty autonomous in what they did, um, there, there, there wasn't much feedback from the outside. I mean, I think, you know, one of the thing, notes in my notebook that I was going through recently said, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, innovation and, and engineering um, create, but marketing refines. And so what happens usually is you get a product out there and the customers then start giving you feedback. So it's that feedback and that when it's in a competitive environment, when it's in a user's environment, that you see um, what you should be building next. And, how, how, and, if it's, and it's usually an incremental improvement of some kind because all of the semiconductor business is incremental. It's, you start out with one transistor and you end up with a billion. It, and, you know, and, and it's it's the Moore's law. So when you're doing uh, technology uh, in the semiconductor business, you're really looking at uh, you know adding more functionality at lower cost, adding more features at lower cost, and and you're building it on the same kind of silicon-based substrate uh, with transistors. Were you taking a brand manager approach at National at that time? Was that I don't. It wasn't called that. It wasn't called that. No. But functionally, did it? But look functionally, like that? it was like that. Yeah. yeah. And do you think National was good at accepting customer feedback? Did they Did they hear it? Did that really affect how they took the business forward? Uh, not in terms of what products they designed. I mean, wider did it himself because he was, you know, he was just going to the next level and the next level and the next level. And inherently he'd been doing this most of his career and so he knew <clears throat> together with uh, Talbot who had to make this stuff. <clears throat> so the more complex and difficult the, the, uh, the structure or the, the diagram of, of what he was doing had to be done in some kind of a solid state device and Talbot knew how to do that. And so these were all incremental developments from one to the next. There was not sort of a, why don't you build this? That really came much, much later. And it came largely in the era of uh, programmable devices. And, and, and I would say that it was the, the, the real growth of that market where there was ability to have feedback was the microprocessor. Because um, you know, the, the c competitors' um, products will either do better than in, in a marketplace or, or, or less. And, um, you know, when um, one, of the, one of the people that I talked to was the head of the um, solid state design at General Micro or GE, and I got to know him. He had a microelectronics lab. Um, I don't recall his name right now, but he was well known in the industry. Uh, uh, actually published a newsletter on it and uh, I remember when uh, uh, Intel was competing um, with their um, 8088 processor against Motorola's 68,000 8 bits versus 16 bit um, he said to me those many of those small companies out there like on the west coast who are using the 68,000 are capturing our imagination. Meaning that's something we could do stuff with and we could do what we want rather than what the designer wants. And that really put the, the sort of uh, the, the push on for National to get to that level quickly. And, and that led to the crush program, but uh, we'll talk about that later. But um, the, 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 the competitive pressures were more um, listen to than the, um, the than the direct feedback from customers. How were your own skills being refined at that time in uh, marketing practice? <laughs> <laughs> um, National was, uh, you know, as Charlie Spork once said, "Do a good job and you can keep it." I mean, it was a tough place. It was um, 
there was it was no nonsense. Um, I heard all these stories about the wild times at Fairchild and the wild parties at sales meetings. None of that occurred, at, at, and it was the same people basically, but none of that occurred at National. It was a very serious, um, you know, um, productivity kind of environment that um, you you had to constantly uh, be pushing for new ways to get the product uh, the product that attention in the customer's mind and um, and hands and uh, for me anyway. And so uh, for me, it was um, two things. One was doing it economically. And, and so, um, and that we produced a lot of literature, application notes, mailed out a tremendous amount, had mailing lists that we maintained. Um, and so one of the th couple of things that I did was uh, uh, on my trips to Europe, I went to Holland and there was a company there called Hankies, Hankies Holland, I think it was called, and it, they were, global printers they printed in in holland but they shipped all over the world so i and, and they were very cheap and so i had all of our literature done there and then shipped back here to the united states and um, so setting that all up and the logistics of it and everything else created and you know i learned a lot doing that and spent a number of times going over there and um and um, they printed the I remember going in, they printed the, the uh, Heineken's labels. And so um, they, uh, I went in there one time and they were printing Heineken labels, big sheets like this with the labels. On, and I asked if I could have one. And of course they said, no, they're all numbered and everything else. And, and I bugged them enough that they gave me one. They finally gave you a sheet of Heineken labels? Yeah. Yeah. And I had it framed and, and I think my son has it. So, um, but that, that, was, that was one of the items. Uh, from the standpoint of creativity then was uh, doing uh, a lot of seminars and uh, small conferences with distributors and reps in the regions. And we did that in most of the major regions of the world. Uh, well, I'd, I'd exclude Asia because Asia was not, uh, it was mostly Europe where were the big users of the, of the early semiconductors. Um, and, and in Japan, there were um, there were obstacles, import obstacles, tariffs, and so forth that made it very hard to get into that country. So they sort of bypassed Japan, even though that's where there was a lot of activity. Korea was not online yet. Um, Taiwan was starting. Um, I know one of I think uh, one of na nationals early. Uh, manufacturing plants was in uh, Taiwan and then in and then they were one they were the first company from this area to go into Korea uh, after the war and um, um, and, and, and that would that was a real challenge because they had to get some legislation out of Washington and there was a fellow who ran their sort of manufacturing worldwide his name was Fred Bilak and Fred was a steam engine. I mean, he just was a no stop him. He could, you no know, one could stop him. He just steamrollered ahead. And I think he told me that um, when they were doing that, he made like three or four trips back to Korea and Washington, D.C., just almost simultaneously in the air just to get legislation passed because it was restricted to do um, American manufacturing there in, in Korea and he also had to get the Korean government to to approve it so but Fred was the guy to do it uh, and he did that for national and he did he that. opened Korea for the yeah. whole country yeah. essentially but for national yeah and and national had a lot of really good uh, uh, manufacturing guys and, um, and, and, and it spawned a lot into the valley um, and um, you know the uh, uh, and, and, and of course, that was the origin of it from Charlie Sport. So it was uh, National was this uh, uh, sort of a you know, engineering and sales company. Um, develop the product and get it out there and find a way to, to sell it. And that, in, in a way, required what do we need to do? And um, and it was not a very sophisticated market. I mean, um, I was in. Um, 
in Baltimore at a, uh, uh, at a distributor's uh, company. And um, one of the salesmen for the distributor came in and said, uh, and I think this was the product, he said, do we make a, a, a 709 linear device? And a 709 was this sort of a, a national standard. I mean, it was out there. It was something that everybody sort of, it was almost like the, the um, you know, the, the deck Vax or something. It was a brand. The 709 was a brand. And, um, and I looked at the guy, and, I, and this was a component distributor, and I said, are you kidding me? And he says, he says, no. I said, come on. You, you, you put, and he says, no, I'm not putting you on. He says, do you, do you make it or don't you? Because if you make it, I got an order. If you don't, then we'll go somewhere else. I mean, this was a salesman. He didn't care what, what, what the performance was. He didn't care what the characteristics were. He didn't care anything else about it. What he cared about was, do you have it? So, uh, and so the, the, you know, as you get down it, it was, it was pretty much, uh, as one former Fairchild sales manager told me, there's only three specs you have to know about a product, you know? Um, <coughs> the, you know, the pins, the, the power, and uh, uh, something else, you know, and then and, and the price. And the price. And he said, you don't have to know anything more than that. And, and so they were, they were some of the old school salesmen. Were you traveling a lot? Yeah, I traveled quite a bit, and for long periods of time. Uh, I would always, I mean, when you go to Europe at the in national, you didn't go over there and fly back. You went over there and you, you worked. You spent two weeks and uh, at minimum every time you went. And, um, you know, you traveled by plane and train. And um, if you couldn't get a plane, you did a train. So it was, um, and, and I went every single country in Europe, I think, from, uh, from Spain to um, Denmark. National grew pretty rapidly, didn't it? Yeah, they grew in about three years from, you know, roughly nothing. They just opened the, the doors of the front company to about 80 million, which was a pretty good growth. That's a big number in yeah. late 60s terms. And, and everybody felt part of it. And on, on Fridays, um, at least in the early years, the early year and maybe two, Spork would, um, a big open area where all the product marketing people sat and so forth. and he would just take out a chair and stand on it, and he would say, okay, I'm gonna update you on what happened this past week, and what are we gonna do next week? And um, he would give, you know, what orders we won, what customers we won, uh, all, all, what the, how the new products were doing, um, and because everybody was a stockholder or a potential stockholder, everybody was excited about it. I mean, it was a, it was a a real group think and um, and then sort of lay out some things you wanted to see done in you know the next week and they could be general things not, not specifically related to the to a chip um, but Charlie was a good leader every morning he would come every single morning he'd come in um, he'd go in his office get his cup of coffee um, and um, he would go out the back in the manufacturing line and would he walk up and down the line talking to each of the, he knew them all by name. And, um, and they, they literally loved him. I mean, because he encouraged them. He was, he, you know, he was, you could go to a party at his house and there would be women from the manufacturing line or, and, and you know, um, vice president or, or you know, one of his, somebody from Fairchild that he knew or whatever. There, there wasn't this, he didn't see people in hierarchies at all. You know, you, you, you were what your performance was. So, it's part of that egalitarian culture you yeah, were talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's, real, I, it's where you really experienced it firsthand. Yeah. yeah. Did the business evolve uh, internationally, in national's business, did it evolve differently from the way it evolved here in, in the U.S.? No, it was pretty similar. In fact, it was very similar. Um, there, there, there was variations by country because of, you know, I mean, it was, it wasn't the common market then, so you know, you're, you had to get your passport stamped on every border, and uh, and getting goods in and out of, uh, of each country 
uh, had its own requirements and, and regulations. Um, and generally, you tried to identify the best possible rep firm and distributor in those areas. And so um, when I would go over, I would meet with those people. And um, generally, some of them would take me out to visit customers. And, um, and uh, that was really eye-opening because, uh, you know, they were 10, 20 years behind here, us here. And, um, but there were some, there was a, a um, I'm, I'm blanking on the names now, but there was some, sem there was a big semiconductor manufacturer, Italian semiconductor manufacturer, uh, and there was a, a French uh, manufacturer. So there were competitors, competitors. in Europe, um, but um, even there, you know, the, the trade magazines reached into uh, um, all of these countries. And uh, one of the things I did was to, um, um, you know, when, when I first went over, was subscribe to all of those magazines. So I got a stack of French, German, Spanish, you name it, journals uh, every month on my desk. And while I, I could read a bit of French and, and, and Spanish, um, um, I would go through them all because you can pretty much, from the visuals, uh, it was like a comic book, you could tell what was going on. Yeah. You know, or you could get a sense for it. And, um, and so that was one of the ways to keep up with what was going on in the um, and, and there were there were Der Spiegel, which was sort of a business magazine, and they would talk about the companies, and a, and a few financial journals. So you could, um, you you could pretty much understand what was going on by uh, you know going through those journals and maybe a dictionary here on the side, uh, a German or French dictionary helped. Uh, but it, it was it, it came clear once you spent some time doing that on a regular basis. And then how did you feed that back into the process? Uh, because there were staff meetings and marketing meetings at National and Valentine, and um, you would come back and, and feed that back into those meetings. Were you the only one doing that from a, a kind of broad market perspective? Yeah, and, and what I would do, and I started this, and then I did it all through my years at my own company, and that is, I w I'm a ferocious clipper. So if I saw things that I thought were important, I would clip them and, uh, and send them out to people in the company. Now, uh, the French was easy. Pierre Lamont, who was also one of the founders of with Spork and uh, National, uh, you know, was, was French, yeah. very French. And, um, and, uh, and certainly Pierre could read all, all those magazines very well. And, um, but yeah, I would, uh, and, and I did some translation, and at least a, a bit of it here and there. I, I, took a, I took German, French, Spanish language in school so I could do a little bit of translation. About a little bit of everything. Just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you told me a funny story. I want to go back to Spork for a minute and working for Charlie Spork. Uh, you told me a funny story about the CFO coming to you and needing some furniture and uh, in, in a building that was not filled with any furniture at all. Could you could you tell that story? Yeah. Uh, well, for some reason, and I think it was largely uh, again because uh, of Fairchild, because Fairchild had a huge um, advertising department, um, and um, they spent a lot of money on ads. They were probably the biggest advertiser in you know electronics industry, I suspect, back in, in those days, um, or one of the biggest. And uh, so I, it, it, I had a big budget, and, uh, and I managed it. And it was my job to, you know, spend it wisely. And um, so uh, his name was John Hughes, and John was the CFO, and John came in one time and shut my door, and he said, uh, oh, no, he called me into his office, and he got up and shut the door, and he said, look, we're going out, we're going to be talking to bankers, we're going to try and get a secondary going here, he said, and he had metal chairs, uh, he had a, you know, a metal desk, uh, 
He's, he, uh, <coughs> he had no, you know, stuff stacked on the floor. Um, and he said, look, I'm gonna bring people in here. And he said, you look at our conference room. I mean, it looks like we just started business yesterday and we went to some used uh, furniture store and bought all this metal furniture. Um, he said, can you get me some furniture? He wouldn't put it through his, his budget. He wouldn't request precedent of Charlie. So um, I said, okay, let me see what I could do. So literally, uh, and this is a funny story. Uh, uh, I went to a, I, my wife actually, uh, I told her about it and she, we went up one weekend. There was a place in Mountain View that did um, sort of decoration type furniture, but it was, it was office furniture and, um, and it was wholesale. And you could go, you know, you could get them and they'd help you design what you wanted, needed designed, you know, from an office standpoint, how you would configure it. And so um, I, I bought furniture for the lobby. I bought, because there was nothing out there. Uh, I, you know, I, I bought furniture for John. And, um, and then I had painters come in over the weekend when no one was there and paint the whole place inside and uh, all the offices and everything. And, uh, uh, and they had these flower pots that they put in the lobby with nice, you know, cylindrical kinds of things about that high. And, um, and <laughs> the people that came in started using them as ashtrays. <laughs> and so that, that's, they, they couldn't tell the difference uh, between what National used to be and what it was now. And, um, and, uh, Charlie came in that Monday morning, and uh, I guess he asked around and found out it was me. And my office was on the other side of the space from his, and I could see him out a little window in the door. And I saw him heading towards my office. And I said, oh, oh boy, I'm in trouble. And so I sort of stood up and I stood behind the door, and he opened up the door and he felt me there, and he pulled the door shut. And he, he literally grabbed me by the then tie pushed me against the wall and he said, look, God damn it, are you done decorating this place? I said, Charlie, we could use some coat racks. <laughs> so, you know, um, the, the, um, the thing that, uh, that I learned very early is that when you're dealing with those semiconductor people, you, you can't be intimidated. You, you have to, you know, and I learned that at GME, you have to sort of step up say what you think, but you also had to not be uh, frivolous or foolish in what you were saying. You had to know what you were doing. And I think, at least by the time I did that, they sort of had enough respect. Um, and, um, you know, when I, when I talk about that, when later I was hiring people to work for me so I could spend more time on the road, um, I went in and I was telling, talking to Valentine about it, and um, and he put out a, one of his, he used to do all his writing on these uh, IBM punch cards, you know, blank or the ones that weren't punched yet, and he would write notes on the back of them in green ink. He always wrote in green ink, and he um, he showed me a list of <coughs> 20, 25 names, and he said, "Here are the people that I interviewed before I hired you," and he said, "Maybe one of those." You could go to work for you. And uh, <clears throat> I said, uh, well, why didn't you hire any of these people? I knew, I recognized some of the names. And he said, uh, I said, why did you hire me? And he said, because I couldn't intimidate you. And so that, that was really a technique that Dawn read and I think in a book somewhere that, you know, if you're gonna work with people, you've got to intimidate. And Charlie and Dawn could be very intimidating. What was intimidating about that? Um, their, their um, sort of Socratic method of questioning you, um, of putting you on the spot. Charlie had a little bit different, but Charlie would ask a question and then not say anything. He could get in a negotiation and say very few words at all, but the person who he was negotiating with would then keep talking and keep coming out with stuff and keep essentially getting closer to his view. And Charlie just would sit there <coughs> 
and just nod. I mean, he and he's you know, six five or whatever. He's a big guy. He's a big he's, guy. He's got a deep voice. Uh, smoke cigars. He was uh, he was not somebody that you were gonna you know mess around with, and uh, so he could be just intimidating in his size alone. Um, but in terms of his ability to you know get what he wanted from a deal or from a negotiation, he pretty much knew how to do that. And uh, and Valentine was very much the same way. And uh, Don would would exhibit a temper. Um, in front of people um, that I always thought was sort of a little bit of a phony temper. Um, and so I didn't, I sort of ignored it. Um, but uh, I literally saw uh, a salesman, um, who actually was a regional manager from, from Europe, who uh, near passed out by being questioned by Don. He had a, he said, I have to take a break, I need some air, I need some water. And literally, uh, they had to take him outside, because Don was just be relentless, and you know, and hitting this guy with his issues and his problems. And um, and, and Don is extremely smart and sharp, and um, you know, and well educated. So uh, he's uh, he was he was a tough guy to work for. What would you say that you you learned from him in those years that you worked for him? Well, I, I, I mean, quite honestly, it was that you, you, you have to look for ways to accomplish your goal, particularly in marketing, that um, isn't necessarily buying your way into it. Um, that is, um, uh, you know, where he, he went out and got reps to start their own firms to handle the national line rather than putting those people on the payroll. That sort of thing, um, where uh, teaching, uh, doing a lot of seminars and workshops for uh, both customers and for people internally. So he'd educate the, the sales force so they could educate the customer. Um, and um, I think the education process was, ex was something I, I learned very early from him. Um, though I will say that GME, my first company put on a lot of workshops and seminars on, on MOS technology and what it was and, and you know what it potentially could do from a design standpoint. Um, and I did and I ran most of those, but um, I think Don did it in a national and international way that was uh, quite effective actually. I mean you see the growth of the company. Um, um, and, and Don was um, Don delegated a lot, he, you know. He he, uh, which I think was an excellent thing. And but then when he delegated, he held he held you responsible and liable for for the results. Um, and um, and so you know that's why I think a lot of people were intimidated because he put a lot of responsibility on you and you had to accept it, or you didn't have to. But if you did, then you were. Um, in a position where or you, you knew you were in a position where you had to fulfill that that commitment to your, to him to you and um, and um, you know it goes back to again sporks overall writing part do a good job and you can keep it um, uh, and although I think he said that in a joke I think he down deep really meant it um, <clears throat> you mentioned Fairchild had a big advertising budget. I want to I want to take a step back now and have you give your assessment of who was doing well in marketing and advertising in that time. Uh, you know, you said the the buyers weren't it, they, it wasn't a terribly sophisticated process. They weren't a, it wasn't a terribly sophisticated customer base. How did that influence the the climate for marketing and advertising and and how were you beginning to think about it in that you know that really intense concentrated period between 67 and 70 yeah um, the, um, the, the advertising was important but it was um, it was much less of uh, sort of image, they call it corporate advertising in those days, right? Um, it was much more product oriented. 
and um, and you know it was getting a new product out and getting it promoted in in the right magazine. So having come out of that world initially, I sort of understood that very well, um, and um, you know. Aside from that, what you wanted to do, and something that, again, that I, I started at GME and National, was part of my budget was getting money to reward engineers for writing articles. And then I found freelance writers to help them, rather than, you know, th they could sit down and give the spec sheets and notes, but they would then talk through the article. I had, I had writers, uh, eventually, on my, on my own staff, or I had them freelance, who would sit down with them and, and actually see that it was done because most engineers were pretty busy and it was very hard for them to write an article. It just took time. And they're gonna redo a thing and redo it and redo it until it's, you know, it's perfect. Whereas someone could hand them a draft and say, here, edit this. And then here, second draft, edit it. And they, they were much more comfortable doing that. So if if you ran your ads but you all but the editorials always had much more credibility and so trying to get the um, the ads and the and the articles you know in the same magazines and and in about the same subjects um really helped them enormously because one could say here it is it's real here's a few specs and here's where you can get it and the other one said, "Here's what you, here's how you can design with it, and here's the benefits of it." So, those things became sort of part of the whole process. And of course, the the, uh, the technical articles um, were placed through uh, directly through the magazines, going to them. And at that time, um, you know, there, there were no editorial offices out here. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, like I said, um, you know, I, th I think Time Magazine had a, an office out here, but it, it, and it had a science editor. And if there were any ed editors or journalists out here, they were science-oriented or industry-oriented. They were not at all into the technology, and they rarely came down the peninsula. Um, only uh, there was Don Heffler from Electronic News, but that was an electronics newspaper. And it, it was it was it, it talked about products, but it mainly talked about people, and a lot of the shifting of positions and who's saying what about whom and that sort of thing. So it was more of a, a sophisticated gossip sheet, um, and um, and uh, but people people read it faithfully. It came out every week, and the and the people loved that because it said who was moving where. It said. Um, who was getting sued by whom, uh, what is the suit over, uh, what are the claims and counterclaims, all those kind of things. And Heffler was right in the middle. He was the, maybe this name's a little old, but Luella Parsons of that age for electronics. And um, so all of that sort of was, came together at the same time and you pretty much had to manage all of it uh, from, you know, getting, those same kind of articles translated and into European magazines um, and uh, getting them placed. And to me, uh, what I did was, um, I told you I collected a lot of the magazines and would subscribe to them, but I started visiting them and going in and meeting the editors and, and introducing myself and then staying in touch with them so I would keep you know, lists of them and, and keep them informed and... Um, that must have been a first for them. For them it was because uh, as, uh, as some of my friends in New York, one of the editors one of the magazine told me, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've never seen anybody from TI. We've never seen anybody from IBM. We've never, we go to them. They don't come to us. And so when I started, I started it, but then, you know, then the next group, if I take Don Valentine or I take Charlie Spork or I take one of the engineers, Bob Weider, or these kind of people. So they would go with me and then these are real live people from the valley here. They weren't, you know, they weren't uh, some strange critters that sort of crawled out of the, the woodwork and are trying to make money or scam the American people. 
Um, now, this wasn't in so much in the business press. It was more into the journals, although I did some with analysts. And, uh, <coughs> and um, you know, I, I got to know an analyst at Morgan Stanley in New York, and I remember him telling me that um, there, there are none of those West Coast companies uh, will, will ever get our attention. He said they're, they're, uh, they're unlikely to succeed. They're too small. They don't have the resources. And the only company that we see, you know, that has a future in technology is IBM. And he told me that directly. Uh, and um, that was sort of the hurdle that you were up against. There was just a huge credibility gap. Not, not credibility. There, it was credibility from not having enough proven successes. Yeah. So almost and these no, were all brand new companies. These were all brand new companies. So you know, once there were a few successful ones, uh, then it started to change, um, and uh, and the economy started to change too. I mean, there were, there's several factors going on. The technology was rapidly becoming um, more friendly in the sense that. Um, uh, the user was able to have more control over what the design of the product would look like because they were soft software. Uh, you could be you could be manipulated with software. You could you could alter the program on a microprocessor and 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 an EEPROM. Then and you couldn't do that with a transistor in any other shape or form. Um, and so the customers became more engaged. Um, the, the real dramatic changes, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead here, but the real dramatic changes in all of this media um, hype and, and development came with the microprocessor and the personal computer. Those two things changed the world. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Um, journalists were started using personal computers. They were on their desks. Now they, now they are one. Yeah. <laughs> you know? They don't have to say, what does that little bug do? Yeah. Um, and, um, and the microprocessor was in, starting to go into a proliferation of, proliferate itself, it, it, its, its um, functions and, and ways of, uh, of, of an applications in just thousands of, of industries. I mean, again, there were things like machine tools, but it could be used in uh, airplanes. It could be used in uh, aerospace equipment. It could, you bought it as a component and you could essentially apply it the way you wanted it to. And so that's whenever sort of the, the, uh, the hobby stores started popping up with kits that you could put the components in and then you could sell the kits yeah. and people would build their own. And, um, and I got to know, for example, um, it was, um, his name was Les Solomon. Uh, he was the editor of Popular Electronics. And he showed me the prototype of the cover when the first Altair personal computer was going to be on it. And um, this was before it, it came out, before it became sort of the, the model. And uh, the, the Altair was, um, um, you know, it, it was a box. It, it didn't have a keyboard, didn't have a, a screen. It was, you know, buttons and switches, but it was a small computer at a very cheap price. And people didn't call it a personal computer, but they called it a home or hobby computer. Yeah. Because personal electronic was a hobby uh, magazine. And so, uh, but, but Les was really excited about it. And other journalists started getting excited about it because it was a low cost computer. When the next was, you know, uh, something coming out of VAX or IBM that was, from a computer standpoint, was millions of dollars. And here we were talking about stuff that was a few hundred. A few hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Did you find, <clears throat> thinking about taking Spork and, and Valentine and Weidler to see these editors, did that change, that begin to change their mind about the way oh, they uh, felt about yeah. what was happening? Well, sure, here? because, you know, you, you, you sort of, uh, you either avoid those things you don't know, or you have negative feelings about what you don't know. And so there, there definitely was an East Coast, West Coast mentality. And uh, it still exists today in, in so many different ways. But um, 
you know, it, a, a lot of it was because it was such a strange industry um, and, and seemed far away from what they were used to doing on, you know, in, in designing things with on the East Coast. So you have to go back and look at some of those magazines uh, and to, to really just see how primitive um, the products that were that they were advertising. I mean, primitive and from our perspective, but not from theirs. Right. Um, it's, it's quite astonishing. And it's hard to imagine that that, is, that has a whole um, social context and infrastructure that, that surrounds it at the time. It, it was, you know, something like, a, you know, a new, uh, you know, voltage regulator uh, could be on the cover of a magazine. And uh, people, you know, would go, wow, that, that, look at the specs on that, you know. And, but, you know, that would certainly it wouldn't even get a mention in anything today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it wouldn't, wouldn't even go into a magazine, it would go on the internet, right? Probably some distribution notice. Did you, how did your background in magazines, and especially having worked for an East Coast-based publisher, uh, did, did that, how did that help you? It must have helped you to- Well, I knew the, the structure of the publishing business. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the job that you know, Richard Rimbach Sr. Get wanted me to do yeah. was to to sort of be a, 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 I was learning how to be, you know, fit his role. So you did everything. Yeah. I mean, you started at, I mean, I, laying out the magazines and pasting type and counting the number of lines and, and pikas, you know, <laughs> between the lines and uh, and so forth. So you you learned everything from the ground up, which is the way he was old school, and um, and you, you learned about um, you know circulation and uh, and uh, you know there were uh, uh, reply cards, you know, and uh, that you would send in, tear out and circle the ads you were interested in or articles and send that in, and then that would in turn go to the user, and they used that to sell from, saying look at all the inquiries you got from this magazine, uh, but. From the standpoint of the user, they were leads, and some people uh, I know I know some people who took those leads and fed each one of them to the sales force and and had them follow up on every single one of them, and it could be hundreds, you know, or thousands, and uh, the whole idea was uh, there's, there was no other way to get to your customers except, and the best way was if they showed an interest, and then go back at them. Yeah. So understanding that must have made you, uh, must have given you something of an advantage when you were thinking about marketing strategy here and that, that since publishing was how so many engineers found out about your product line, you understood that, and the, the, the whole publishing channel in a way maybe other people didn't understand it. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, th I think I got to appreciate the, the technical ed editors at these magazines because uh, at Rimback, um, it was a small family-owned publishing company, maybe 20, 30 people in the company. <clears throat> and so, um, the, uh, and a lot of those were outside in sales and so forth. Uh, but internally, every day at lunchtime, you went up to a big room where you had lunch. And the people who sat around the table were the editors. And so every lunch was a discussion about what they're working on. Every discussion was, uh, should we run this or shouldn't we run this? Or what do you think about this? That sort of thing. Now, I, I wasn't necessarily participating, but I was there and, um, and eager to learn. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, there, and there were discussions beyond that. I think one of the key factors was that the editors spent maybe half the lunch talking about that and the other half talking about <coughs> the, uh, you know, the, either the Korean or the Vietnam War. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they went into a lot in the politics and the government and, and um, you know, some of them were inventing, guys were inventing, uh, uh, you know, in their minds, different types of contraptions. The, a way of improving the automobile and things like that. They were more mechanical, electromechanical uh, uh, engineers, uh, although we did have a, a electronic des uh, systems design. Uh, 
and the medical electronics. So you, you got a variety of opinions and, um, and understanding how they're human beings and uh, they're not, you know, these sort of automatons that simply take something and turn it into print. Yeah. Um, and, um, and they're certainly not people that don't have a mind of their own, which is what I think a lot of, uh, and still do, a lot of the, the customers out here, the people, um, the manufacturers think, uh, you know, that the media is there to, you know, basically restate what they say, but do it the way they want it. And, uh, and, and there's some pretty hard-nosed people out there that were that way. Uh, they really would get upset or cut, cut the advertising because they didn't like something that was said. But again, they would be people who largely would defend the freedom of speech, but they would um, want the Until journalists to do something bad was it. said about them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are a couple of other things I want to talk about in this session, uh, which sets the stage for you deciding to leave National and start your own company. The first is the the rapid growth of everything in Silicon Valley at that time in the late in the late 1960s, uh, from the standpoint of technology companies and, and semiconductor companies in particular, really being on the rise. Can you talk a bit about? that environment, 68, 69, 70, that whole era? Sure. Uh, well, you know, this this was a sort of a, this was the birth of that industry, right? Yes. The semiconductor uh, solid state technology uh, industry. And um, and the, the early companies, you know, were, as I said, were semiconductor, but they built everything. They basically got, um, you know, people who could do metal fabrication. They would hire all these subcontractors, but they basically designed what they wanted and then uh, would order specialized parts from places and it would all arrive, not in one big box, but in separate boxes and then they would assemble it and do all the tweaking and testing and things themselves. Um, I, and I think I told you that GME made its own ingots uh, uh, silicon ingots, and uh, you know, by the time Fairchild or uh, National came along, National was buying those ingots, and probably from Japan or from some internet, uh, maybe China, uh, Taiwan. Um, but they certainly weren't making them at National, um, and. Um, the the so one of the very first industries that started being independent was the semiconductor equipment manufacturers. So there's companies that started forming to build these things for the semiconductor people. Yes. Um, Applied Materials was a very early company. They started when I was at National. And, um, and um, the strange thing is that they had a devil of a time convincing the semiconductor manufacturers that they knew how to build products for their processes. Really? Yeah. And they're right here. They wouldn't do it. The, the semiconductor guys said, no, we know how to do it better ourselves. Oh. It's the not invented here. Uh, you know, and, and um, it was how one of the first conversations that I had with Jim Morgan when he went to Applied Materials is that some major, com major semiconductor companies you know, uh, refused to actually uh, buy their equipment because they felt that it it couldn't it, it couldn't meet meet up with their standards and do what they wanted to do. <coughs> and so, um, and there were no standards. I mean, that was the thing that the industry was doing was trying to create standards. And um, <coughs> so, that was really a lot of the early ones was the components and pieces of the manufacturing process that went into the semiconductor company. And that, then that expanded to that next layer. Um, the, the venture people were here, um, and, uh, and for example, in the 70s, um, there were, um, I was thinking about some of the companies that, that I had, was, um, was a company called Diasonics. And Diasonics had um, 
Well, I'm trying to think of the name of the fellow who founded that. Uh, but in any event, uh, uh, Kleiner uh, and uh, Tom Perkins and Gene Kleiner invested in it and because it came out of uh, uh, HP uh, instruments. <clears throat> and uh, what they did was an ultrasound scanner and they were able to do the first ultrasound scanning, for example, of the of a fetus uh, in, in, in the womb of a woman. And you couldn't do that with x-rays, so you had no idea if there was some issue or problem. And I can remember seeing the first scans of, that they showed around the office that they were able to do. Um, another company that was a client of ours in the early 70s, and these are again after I got into business, but again it was the 70s were right on the heels of, of you know, companies like National getting started and right. so forth, um, was a company called Lightronics, and Lightronics made um, light emitting diodes. Uh, so uh, up until that time, if you bought a computer, it had what is called Nixie tubes. And Nixie tubes were glass, like, like a vacuum tube, but the segments were inside there and you lit up, it was just shaped, you lit up which segments you wanted to represent. So if this was a nine, you only lit up the segments there. If it was a one, you just lit up, you know, the central line. And so it was, it was, it was controlled by, you know, um, by the power source, but on the other hand, it was then you know, various devices would segment and, and, and allow you to count or do letters or whatever. But sitting on top of machines would be these Nixie tubes that you could read. Yeah. Uh, those were replaced by uh, gallium arsenide. Did you, when you applied the, the current to them, they, they lit up these little, little pieces of, of, uh, of uh, gallium arsenide chips. And uh, one of the companies was a company called Lightronics and they started out manufacturing um, little plastic enclosed, so they were, it, 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 you could just look like you could plug it right in like a chip on a circuit board. And so it, but, the, but it read out the, the numbers or the letters that you wanted. So it went from <clears throat> glass, you know, this big, to a little piece of plastic that big. And uh, <coughs> they were over in Cupertino. Um, and when we get in my company, we can talk more about those, but uh, we, we did an ad for them that was said, you can stop whistling Nixie. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but, you know, if I, I've, people don't know what a Nixie is anymore. I mean, yeah. there, there's no way for them to even, but that was very, again, common talk in those days. How do we get rid of this glass and that heats up and burns out? And, all that sort of thing, where you got all the benefits of a solid state device. It was, you know, reliable, it lasted a long time, it didn't heat up, uh, not to the same extent that you would get a, a vacuum tube. So <clears throat> there are companies like that, that um, there was a company here called Spectrophysics that was also there in the, in the 60s. Yeah. And Spectrophysics, um, you know, were a laser company and they also produced uh, um, they had a company called Auto, uh, I think it was called Auto Lab. It was they automated uh, uh, equipment for the, the chemistry lab. So there were a lot of really you know science type based people. Um, the, the, the founder was a guy named Herb Dwight out of Stanford, and um, and um, another one was uh, Sam Le, uh, Le Coletta became, uh, he was one of the, he became president later on, but he ran uh, various divisions. But, you know, getting the, the laser into production, um, and, and one of the things that we handled was the, the first air-cold laser, uh, uh, you know, um, and that was significant because you had a, you know, most lasers burn very hot, yeah. And you needed uh, cooling equipment. <clears throat> the cooling equipment was huge and expensive, but to have a, uh, an air cold one was phenomenal. And that then led to more diverse applications, such as scanning. <laughs>
and the ability to have uh, something sit in a counter at a grocery store the under near was a laser yeah. and that laser could read the scanning code and interpret it into digital so the rise of the of digital electronics the rise of things like that really came all together and so this is where other companies started benefiting from the you know not only their ability to lower the cost and improve the performance and usability of the product but also uh, it, it, it was in sync with the other industries that were yep. rising at the same so time. So you had the <clears throat> you had the component layer, you had the finished product layer, then you had whole industries being created out out of those those new right. ideas for right. the finished products. Right. And, and all and, happening and, here. And, and and if you were to go in the early '60s, and people would talk about the fact that these lasers would be in your supermarket, they'd think you were crazy. Um, you know, maybe some far out right. thinkers were thinking about it, but certainly not uh, anybody in the mainstream. So that was one <clears throat> environmental factor that was taking place. Then there was a second one, uh, which was just the growth, the sheer growth of the, the semiconductor industry as it was. We were talking okay. about how this was a period when the rise of semiconductors was enabling the rise of everything else. So. Yeah, and so, so much of the the advancement or new, you know, products that are out in the marketplace today, are the result of the rise of not just one company or industry, but of a lot of different industries <coughs> that came together and their technology became improved over time. And the best illustration of that is um, the insulin pump. I'm a, I've been a diabetic for 60 years, and um, and I've always used this since well since they came out in the, in the early 80s. And at that time, uh, I was curious about whether or not they used uh, what kind of uh, processor they used in the device. And so I I called the, uh, the fellow um, what's his name I forget his first name but it's Cayman. Dean Cayman. Uh, Dean Cayman. Uh, and, and I'm not even sure how I got his name, but I got it, but I read about him. And so I, I called him and phoned him and he, he answered the phone. And so we started chatting and, and I, I, he originally had a brother who I think was a doctor, uh, or working on, um, uh, chemotherapy at some place like Stanford or, uh, Princeton, I'm sorry. And, uh, he, he said that, um, he wanted to apply this into the chemotherapy, or so he he built one, but it, it it wasn't sufficient, and I think they found that it it just didn't do the job that they wanted in terms of delivering several different types of chemical-based medicines at, at the same time. And when they when he, they published an article on it, someone said, "Hey, that would make a, a wonderful insulin pump," and so then they talked to him, and he then designed a single thing. And so the, what I said was, that's really great. I mean, what process, he says, well, let me, let me just tell you, there was a lot of technologies that had to come together to make this. He said, so it wasn't any one element. For one thing, you had to have tubing that didn't crimp. And he said, so that's polymers and, and you know, basically plastics that you have to it has to achieve something, something in which it can't crack, break, and is subject to all kinds of environmental conditions. He said there's a, a, a low power battery in there, so battery power required. So that has to have come to a site where you can get a battery small enough that will go into a portable device that also will last long enough and be reliable enough to, you know, not fade on you when you need it. You had to have a processor uh, in there. And so he went through all of the various technologies that composed this. And I'd say there were 10 or 15. Um, and that, and so there wasn't just one. Well, displays. You had to have a, a you know, the display material now is LCD in here. And so you had to have the display, but you also had to have the ability to, um, do the measurement on how much insulin's going in and what the display said. All that technology really came up through the the, the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, 
And so by the time, the early 80s, when he was, they were designing this, everything came together that enabled them to build a miniature device. But he couldn't have done it 10 years earlier. And so it's, it's the same with you know, Apple's iPhone. It's the same with uh, you know, a lot of the advancements that Apple's made in watches. Yeah. You couldn't have done that 10 years earlier. So when Steve said that uh, you know, back in the, uh, uh, I, and I, back in, what, when was it, the early 80s? He said uh, it's going to take Apple another three to five years to get into the consumer business. Um, it really took until he came back in 98? Nine, yeah. So um, then by that time, the state of processors, the state of memory, the state of the, the internet was there. The internet wasn't there in 81. Um, all of the, the kinds of technologies that came together in the iPhone, um, graphics devices, um, communi communications, miniature antennas, all of those kind of things had to come together at the same time that they could then assemble into this. And it, and it wasn't all created by Apple, it was created by suppliers yeah. that they then you know, handpicked and then orchestrated into a device that everybody's using today. So here in the Valley, the same thing was happening. It was, there were, there were industries here, but they tended to be less risk, more risk averse as, as companies. Um, and I'd put Varian and HP into that. They ended up, um, I mean, they're still around, but they're not anywhere near the dominance that they had in the Valley. And HP is, is as you know, fading fairly fast. I mean, Apple replaced it as the, 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 you know, the, the top of the, the 150 top companies in Silicon Valley uh, a few years ago. And probably uh, this year, other companies will displace it even further down the list. Um, and, um, and, and certainly you can't, you, you know, as much as people talk about Lockheed being here, um, it really never had it, much of an influence on the Valley. Um, uh, I think it probably used some of the components, but it was never even a big customer of any, anybody that I knew. Um, and um, uh, and I'm sure that's different today. I'm sure that they're, they're, they buy a lot of Probably electronics. a big customer now. Yeah, yeah, Certain yeah a big customer now. Um, but again, back when the Valley was first being formed in the 60s, that wasn't, wasn't the case. They were still working on World War II equipment. <laughs> um, and, and so the, the companies that were, well, one of the other stories was, was that uh, I was at, uh, I don't know, it was GME or, uh, uh, I think it was GME, and uh, I got a, there was a the phone came in and, and nobody was around, so I answered it and I started talking to him and he says, I want to learn. So I says, well, I'm with Frieden, this calculator company across the bay here, and I, I want to learn something about, uh, about MOS technology. And um, I said, uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but I, I'll do what I can because I've, you know, put together the training course and everything. So I knew enough of the basics. So I started talking to him and so forth, and he kept asking questions. And finally, after a while, I said, look, you're getting a little bit beyond me. I'm going to have to get you. So he says, no, you're doing just fine. He says, I'm a mechanical engineer. He said, if I don't learn this stuff, I'm going to be looking for a job in a few years. And, and indeed, Frieden went out of business. They were, a, a com, you know, they were elect, electromechanical calculators. The calculator would cost a, maybe the average calculator was fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, maybe twenty-five thousand dollars, and they were replaced by, uh, you know, uh, things that are given away as incentives today. Yeah. Um, and and that happened overnight, and the business was all on service. I mean, you basically, you know, it was, they, they broke down a lot. So you had a serviceman come once a week and there was a service contract and that's how they made their money. So those businesses went away from the Valley here. And uh, just as the tube manufacturers did and, um, um, and, and a lot of other companies, but um, it, it was pretty significant uh, change in, in what was here before. And I think it was such a, uh, a, uh, um, exponential change, I'll use that, <laughs> that, that, um, that you can't even say that it relied on that industry being here to create the next industry. 
it was really a, 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 a you know a, a, a staccato change. It was a new thing. Yeah. Completely new thing. Yeah. Um, something I did want to touch on before we move on to the the birth of Intel and all of this, which sets the stage for a later session we're going to do on Intel, was the the ethics of competition in the Valley at that point, for lack of a better word. Uh, what, what was the code of conduct when it came to competition in the Valley in, in this period? Uh, or what, could you say there was one or? I, I can't, I don't think you can apply a generic, what was the code, I think it differed by company. Uh -huh. um, and, but I, I can say this, that it was a small enough community that if you were a negative influence within your company, everybody knew about it very quickly. And so, um, you know, the ability to um, do things that were out of sight or out of mind of anybody else was very hard to do, particularly in the semiconductor industry. Now, there were, com there were people who were questionable. There were people that were... Um, I think doing things that in terms of uh, how they got financed and how the deals they made and those kinds of things that were uh, from time to time brought up. Um, but those people didn't, didn't survive very long. And um, so I, I, you know, from my standpoint, it wasn't something that was talked about often and, and, or even, uh, even sort of over dinner talk or over drinks. Um, about did you hear about what so and so did, um, you know? And, but I'm I'm sure like any other industry, there was a, there was a lot of that somewhere going on. There was a lot of poaching of talent, wasn't there? I mean, there was well, that was that was yeah. And and for whatever reason, I mean, there were, for example, National never got sued by Fairchild, and there was claims that it's because everybody at Fairchild bought stock in the company before you know <laughs> when they left, and and that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and so, you know, Fairchild was uh, uh, selective in who it sued that spun out. And, um, but, you know, it was, a, it, it was a little bit like, um, uh, you know, having spun all these guys and spawned things, you would think that it had depleted all its resources. And, um, and it really did get down, obviously, to later years whenever it pretty much had depleted itself of all of its really talented people. Uh -huh. And so it, it really, um, and they brought in uh, Lester Hogan. Yeah. And, um, and um, Hogan, I think, did a yeoman job, but um, you know, he was never one of the, one of the boys. He was, uh, I think he was a professor before he came in. And, and I don't think he quite, um, he, I don't think he was tough enough in terms of uh, sort of ruthlessly going after people. You told me the story once of uh, this notebook showing up in your office that had a bunch of resumes in it from a competing company. Can you, can you tell it, that again? It, yeah, it, it, well, that was, uh, uh, and, and this was a fellow who uh, I guess was introduced to me by our head of HR and he didn't know what to do with it. He came in and he said, this fellow has a, and he knew I was, at National, I told you that we each had a competitor to monitor. And so I learned everything I could about Motorola. That was mine. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, so this, this book uh, came in and, and landed on my desk. And it was resumes of all the engineers at Motorola. Uh, who were doing designs and so forth. I wouldn't say it's all of them, but a, a lot of them. And that was from a recruiter, though, that, that wasn't from a manufacturer. It came from um, some recruiting firm. And, um, and I took it over to Spork, and Spork said, put it in an envelope and send it right back. I don't want to see it. Don't even look at it. Um, you know, and um, whether or not he was concerned about lawsuit or not, I don't know, but Charlie had... Charlie had very high standards and ethics, I think, and um, um, and, and 
quite frankly, I think that really he, he soared in my mind and uh, just by that that one decision. Um, and um, you know, I I probably would have said, hey, look at this, this is great. You know, I mean, I don't know what I didn't know the business that well <laughs> at the time. Um, I figured, how do you get the names of all these people? But yeah. you hire recruiters who go in and and talk to them. So let's now let's go back to the subject of spinouts uh, from Fairchild, and of course, in the same period, you're we're talking about with you at uh, National. Bob Noyce spins out of Fairchild and decides to strike out on his own. Can you talk about <clears throat> uh, your your recollections of how that happened, when you met them, what sort of news that made in the Valley, if any, at the time? Yeah, I, I didn't meet them till actually I formed my own company. Okay. Uh, so that would have been around 71. Um, but... Um, but the, the 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 noise was out there. The 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 information was out there in the public that they had spun out, and 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 I and I probably have uh, I've gotten a lot of these conferences of saying there was the Western Electronics, there was Westcon they called it, that sort of show where they everybody would be at, and uh, and so you you know you get the scuttlebutt of everything that's going on, and people would go to that. It was usually held up at the Cow Palace. In South San Francisco, and um, that was a big event every every year, and so that's where a lot of the gossip got traded. Uh, but don't forget, the the first products out of out of uh, Intel were bipolar products. They they weren't the MOS products mm -hmm. that came later, um, and so the bipolar was was um, uh, you know they were p high performance products and. Uh, were generally uh, more expensive, um, just because of the, both the process and the, the performance level that they could. Uh, but they really didn't hit the sort of the mainstream products until they got into the MOS technology, which took a few years before they were able to do that. And um, um, in the meantime, there was a host of of different types of there was a you know, bipolar rams and and, and uh, various types of uh, bipolar um, logic devices and things like that 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 uh, were made with a different technology that um, that were sort of the the generation before the 1975 to 80 generations of of, of semiconductors. So was it not simply just wasn't that noteworthy other than the fact of who was involved that uh, it was the who was involved yeah and and uh, you know those people were were uh, really admired as individuals yeah. and, um, and I you know I I don't know I didn't know the others too I knew Gene Kleiner pretty well um, uh, and I got to know him really well when he was at Kleiner yeah. uh, Perkins um, but um, Really, uh, Gordon and Bob had reputations that preceded them throughout the industry about being just outstanding individuals, uh, brilliant, um, but very, very um, human. Um, you know, uh, people used to worry about both of them and that you could stop them in the halls and, and tell them you want to do something. and if, and they would never really oppose you, but they wouldn't necessarily say, yeah, go ahead. But they felt so good afterwards, they always thought he's, they meant okay. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> both of them were, were uh, um, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty gentle people. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and highly, as I said, highly respected. So there was a lot of curiosity over what they might do and what were they working on. Um, I remember that at National, they, were, they talked about it. Um, Charlie Spork and Noyce were close. Um, and, um, and there was even some conversations about Noyce talking to Charlie about the two companies merging in those early days. Um, and because um, uh, uh, Noyce, really um, 
Norris was really much more holistic in the sense that when he looked at a, a semiconductor product, he looked in terms of its of its cost, its 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 technology could produce generations that continue up the up the uh, Moore's law list, but also the, the decline of cost, and so that you could get you know have better margins, but also uh, increased or decreased price to the customer. So he knew that you had to get this cost down substantially to overcome previous generations of products. And he also knew that to do, you broaden markets by doing that. I mean, and, and he, he talked about this openly. I mean, I mean, I, you know, going back and looking at the very few things that are printed about him or that interviewed him, were interviews of him, uh, with him, um, he really did have a foresight on, on the, the, the world of solid state technology and uh, what was possible with that. Um, I, I told the story, he was at a, shortly after um, he, uh, he, he uh, they formed Nash, uh, Intel, a couple, maybe a year or two. Um, they were at a, I think it was American Electronics Association uh, conference up in Palo Alto at one of the hotels there. And uh, Noyce was on the panel and uh, he was asked, um, he, he, he was waxing on the fact that someday this technology is gonna be, you're gonna be able to uh, you know, run your whole business on, on you know, a chip of silicon. And, um, and somebody in the audience later asked a question and said, well, if I drop that chip on the floor and it falls in a crack, then, I'm out, then I go bankrupt. And Charlie says, no you won't because they'll be cheap enough to where you'll have it distributed everywhere and duplicated. And so um, that, was, that, was, that was sort of that East Coast, West Coast. East, the West Coast was much more small, distributed, share the work. East Coast was big, monolithic, and hierarchical. Their, their architectures are that way. Their companies are that way. Out here, the companies were much more egalitarian, much more distributed um, work. And, um, and that's the way the technology came out too. So there's a lot of analogies between the structures of the corporations out here and the technology and, and architectures. And, um, and, and, you know, and that's one of the reasons why I think there was reticence by the, a lot of the media, particularly the business media, to, to look at the West Coast as being serious. Because it was just so unconventional. It, it, was, it, was, it wasn't big. It wasn't big. It wasn't you know, massive. It wasn't trying to be massive. It yeah. was trying to build small things. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but Noyce, Noyce really did foresee the, the, the technology changing the, 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 the way our lives are lived. Very early. Very early. Now let's talk about <clears throat> your eventual decision to leave national you there weren't many people in your position that had the kind of scope that you had were there in in marketing terms just in what you were called upon to do and what and what you invented to do uh, when you were at national yeah most of the people were uh, advertising managers they called them I mean there really wasn't what we would call PR so functionally that was yeah. a job description right. would have been advertising manager yeah. and and I think mine was, you know, marketing services, which meant whatever, you know, services that the marketing people or department needed. And, um, and um, I don't think that a lot of them gave, were given the same kind of responsibilities or, let me say, um, even the freedom to exercise their responsibilities. That would be my viewpoint. Because, you know, back when I was with the publisher, I used to meet a lot of them. And, uh, and hear their complaints. Um, and um, I think that um, the, the ability to, um, to have a sort of a, now at least two startups under my belt, um, and you know, one failure, and of course National was at the time I left very successful and, and gonna be more successful. Um, so I, you know, but I, 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 again, just in retrospect, I don't think GME was such a failure. 
in that the technology went on to become part of the standard technologies of today, and the people um, also went on. So that um, in, in one of my presentations, I have uh, you know the missing link, I call it, and it's uh, Joel Carp. Joel Carp was at GME. Uh, and became the first MOS engineer at Intel. And um, Les Fidesz hired him, and he hired him to bring him in to get them going down the path of building uh, this uh, uh, MOS silicon transistor. And because he had been working on that at GME, and then he brought a whole teams of people with him. So in the sense that it sort of played the role in the valley of going back and using your experience and your failures to build something better or to go to the next step, it's a good case. Yeah. Um, so um, I think that um, the two startups, and then, you know, it was a valley in which there was rapid growth all over. I think I mentioned before that the way the buildings were built, they were called tilt-ups. <coughs> right. And these buildings literally hold blocks of, of, of factories, if you would, would go up overnight. You'd go drive it down one day, it'd be empty, and the next, you know, a few weeks later, there's buildings being formed. They'd pour the concrete, pour the walls on the, on the ground, tilt them up, you know, patch them together, and that became a building. Um, and uh, so they were happening all over, and uh, I had a number of of people call me or uh, you know search search people call me and so forth and and uh, I by by the late 1969 um, it wasn't the travel it was more the repetitiveness of the of the job I was pretty much doing I mean, I, I could pretty much do the job with my eyes shut because yeah. you weren't I wasn't learning anything more and um, and so the whole idea was, um, you know, maybe if I were on my own, I you know I could diversify a bit. And um, and then actually there was a, there was a, a it was kind of a market recession at that time, <coughs> and my the stock options I had were below well below water at National. Um, but that was the common cyclical, whatever the reason I don't remember, but. Um, the, the, you know, my, my options, I, I wouldn't have made any money if I had left then on my options or cashed them in at that time. So I just decided, well, you know, in fact, I know that Spork and Valentine both did that argument, well, you know, your options will, you know, will make you some money here if you stay. And I said, um, um, I, think I, I think I'll be able to make more money myself, you know. <laughs> and, and I'll be the only optionee, an optioner, okay. and so um, and um, so I had a call from uh, a fellow who was working at um, um, American Microsystems, and that was um, his name was Walt Andrews, and Walt was a former salesman from Fairchild, and he worked for a guy named Howard Bob, who was um, Howard was um, I think he ran the might have been the, the head of the military sales and all that at, uh, at Fairchild, but he came out of that military segment anyway. And, uh, and he was also at, at GME. So um, I knew him uh, and, and Walt from that. And um, they, they wanted me to come over and do what I was doing at National with this new company that was um, Somewhat of a, 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 had a lot of systems engineers uh, involved, and they were talking about building more LSI type devices that became part of systems, and so it was kind of moving up the next level of technology. And um, um, so, what I went back to Walt with a proposal saying, um, I I don't want to go to work for uh, another company. But I, this is to keep my diversity open in terms of my own goals. Um, but I will, um, I'll do it for a fee. So if you pay me a, a mini fee, I mean, you won't have any overhead. I'll, I'll do the same job. I'll 
do all the things you need done, but I'll do it outside the company. And, uh, and Walt came back to me a few days later and said, uh, Howard agrees to it, he'll do it. And so I said, great, I've, I've got a business. And um, I didn't have any money and I didn't have an office and I didn't have anything else, but I put my uh, resignation in to, to Valentine. And, um, and um, what was his reaction? Uh, I think I, it's when I realized that Don was going to leave uh. because he didn't tell me that, but he didn't argue with me. He didn't try to convince me to stay. And under normal circumstances. And I, I, I mean, I'm, you know, maybe I'm being a little egotistic there, but um, he said, just you have to hire your replacement, as all Don said to me before you leave. And so he didn't have anybody in mind, and it wasn't as if, you know, whatever. Um, and Charlie didn't want me to leave. I mean, he, he tried to talk me into staying. Um, and because we were doing a lot more financial um, communications. And, um, but I, I, I think I went home and said to my wife, I think Don's going to leave too. And, um, and he did. He left, <coughs> I think he left less than a year later. Um, but um, uh, in any event, I got a call from Walt saying that um, he wanted me to come over and meet with Howard um, after work one night, and I did, and I went over, and it, it, was, it was just on the, uh, it was out in Cupertino there where a lot of the HP places then were filling in there. Um, it, was, it, it wasn't very far from where I live, or it wasn't very far from National, uh, just across uh, El Camino. And uh, when I got over there, I went into Walt's office, and the conference, there's a little conference room next to it, and I hear people shouting and swearing and slamming things. And, and it went on for quite a while. And uh, I think once maybe Walt came over and said, uh, we're, we're, we're hammering some things out, <laughs> literally. About you. And, and, yeah. And, uh, and, and actually, it wasn't about me. Uh. Um, it, it, it turns out that um, there was uh, the chief operating officer of the company um, who really ran the company, who had other p designs in mind. And, um, and um, I, you know, and I'm not going to get into that, but anyway, it was a, a person that he admired <laughs> closely. And, um, and um, he, he, was, he was adamantly against having me do that. And, um, and so they, they had to agree with him. He was a, a, you know, a good employee and a talented guy. And so uh, I got up and left. I didn't even wait for their out, so I went, I went home and went home. And Walt called me that night, and he says, where, where did you go? I said, well, if you, you think I'm getting in the middle of your arguments, I'm not going to do that. You know, I said, so thanks, but no thanks. So I had already resigned. I had, had been interviewing people, and um, I was out of, out of a job, and I hadn't started anything yet. So I went to uh, a company called Electronic Rays. It was run by a, or one of the guys that was founder was guy named Earl Gregory, and Earl was uh, my boss at GME, at General Microelectronics. And, um, and I talked to him about doing his work. And uh, in fact, I think I have the one page, still have the one page outline that I put down the things I would help him do. And I was much more familiar with him and, and what he operated. And um, he said, well, you know, we just hired some people to do that and or outside agency, so I don't, I don't think we need it. And he said, but there's a little company that we're an investor in down in Santa Clara called Monolithic Memories. And Monolithic Memories was um, uh, a new company, brand new. It was started by a uh, founder, was a guy named Zev Drory. And, um, and so I went down to see Zev, and Zev's intentions were to compete with National. So he loved my background. He, he wanted me there. Um, he was a, like a bull in a china shop, though. He just, he, uh, there was no finesse about Zev. He was, he was a, uh, I think it was an Israeli paratrooper, and he, he ran his business like that. 
um, um, and, and a, a nice person, but a tough guy. And um, so he said, yes, I want you to do it. And I said, fine. I said, but I need, I really need two clients. And I said, so um, you have to call Earl and tell him that you'll do it if he'll do it. And he did. He called Earl Gregory and said, um, I'll, I'll do this. Uh, I'll hire Regis if you do. And so Earl then had to make up his mind, and he did it. And so I had two clients to start, and I, they were both on fees. <clears throat> so I really started out by going to the bank with a check, the two checks that were, they usually paid you a month in advance, or, and so I had at least enough to get by mm -hmm. two months. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> I rented uh, part of an office up in, uh, on, at University Avenue. It was in an old <coughs> Victorian house. A friend of mine was a, a graphics designer there, a guy that I had used at National, and he gave me some space, a, a one room. And so that's where I, I started out of that, that space. And, and I offered that guy to, to share, you know, that I would run the business if he would, uh, um, if, if, you know, if he, he'd share the business with me. Yeah. And he turned that down. So he ended up, you know, being a designer for the rest of his life and okay. doing data sheets. <laughs> Did you have a vision for how you would work with these companies that was different from the way other uh, advisors or or uh, marketing groups they might have hired would have done things well it was different from the standpoint that I had I had been there I'd been inside the company which I think really was uh, uh, a, 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 a real advantage for me and uh, and the experiences that I had at both companies was pretty extensive I mean it involved uh, there's a international travel involved working with distribution channels, you know, salesmen putting education programs together, um, training programs for the sales forces, all of those kind of things, um, and all of the conferences and trade shows and doing the technical articles and hiring freelancers to all that sort of stuff, you know, um, they could find in in one package, and. Um, and it was for a fee. It was they didn't have to bring it in and put it in house. And so uh, startups liked that idea, that they didn't have to add extra cost, and yet they could get what they wanted. And um, so yeah, I I got um, both of those to sign on, and I you know and the first thing you do is go in and say, what do you want me to do or what's the problem and. Um, you know, you, you, you spend a few days talking with everybody and what they think they need and what they want to do and where they're going and you sort of take that all down and then try to come back with some sort of a proposal to them on how to do the work now and, and, and what it is and how much it's going to cost um, in costs, not necessarily in fees, but in costs. And um, so I would do that and it, it worked out pretty well, I think, within Easily within two years, maybe three, uh, I had nine semiconductor companies. So went from you know basically uh, two to nine in, uh, in about two years. In a very short amount of time. Yeah. This is a very entrepreneurial story. Did you think of yourself in entrepreneurial terms, starting a business like this and really going at it the way that you did? Only my nerves <laughs> and my wife's, my wife's nerves. Uh, you know, we, we uh, be honestly, we had 500 bucks in the bank, so uh, two kids and uh, so it was, um, no, three kids, I guess, on the way. And uh, so it was... Uh, it was a risk. It was a big risk, yeah. But I actually felt I could always get a job. I mean, I felt comfortable with that. The, the one thing that, that working at both GME and National and in the semiconductor industry gives you is you either are self-confident or you don't survive. And so you learn to be self-confident. You learn to, to be more aggressive and, 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 you know, and not introverted in the sense that, well, I don't know, listen, wait till somebody else talks or whatever. You, you don't. You, you speak up. Uh, or you get out, <laughs> and so um, 
I think that those two experiences really brought a lot of self-confidence to me. And having sort of not lived in that environment before, knowing very, very little about it when I started it, uh, in fact, almost nothing about it in terms of its real business um, processes and, and uh, com you know, the competitive environment. But you learn that very quickly because you have to. And you learn it very quickly when you spend time with customers and sales forces and distributors and reps and <coughs> in, in, in maybe 20 countries. And they don't have a lot of time to waste uh, right. themselves. But I mean, you're, you're learning from them as to you know, what's, what's wrong back in the home office. Yeah. And so you get a lot of input very quickly by doing that. And I think one of the first things that, like at National, was I was on the road within, within weeks of starting and uh, you know, trying to help set up. Uh, well, I did help, help move the inventories from back east back out there and then, and then help set, set up the European operations. And I went there with Spork and Valentine and I think uh, Fred Bilek and Pierre, all of us went to Munich together and I was in the room when they interviewed people and when they were uh, setting up their European operations. So, um, you know, I don't think too many people get that kind of an experience that were in the roles that I was in. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think it was, it was really unique in that uh, I was exposed to so much of the total management of these companies that you're normally not, you're normally looked at as almost like an internal vendor rather than somebody that you can take into their confidence. Mm. Mm. And you were barely 30 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Worked hard. <laughs> <laughs> my neighbors even used to mention that. They would, they said they used to see my dining room light on all night because I would sit at the table. Knowing you were up working. Yeah. 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 